I think it's important for people to think about the Israel-Palestinian conflict and just the Middle East generally from the perspective of individual lives matter. That's the starting from the moral perspective. And that, that means you should, a good society is one, as we talked about earlier, the kind of society that lets you live according to your judgment and pursue your goals and be able to thrive. And if that's your moral framework, then we really need to rethink our approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And part of what I try to get people to see is, if you view it from the perspective of where, what kind of society would you, you the reader, prefer to live in and why, and think about that, Israel is an outlier in the sense, in that region, and I think it, it's more akin to the kind of society we have today in the U.S. and in Western Europe. It's an outlier because in its fundamentals, it is a free society. Now, I have a lot of criticisms of Israel's society. I wish it were freer. I think there's too much religion in their, in their government. But fundamentally, it's free. And it is a stark contrast to the kind of societies all around it in the region. And, the, and that has real life personal significance to the lives of people in the, those societies. So growing up in Israel, you have opportunities and freedoms and, and, and you're able to do things with your life that you just could not imagine doing in Saudi Arabia, for example. So, uh, so in Israel, if you're a woman growing up, you could start a company, right? You could be on TV. You could be a journalist. You could actually write what you think. No one's going to tell you what to put in the newspaper. You could be the prime minister. Actually, don't women have to serve in the IDF as well? Yeah, as many men? women are called in yeah. to serve in the IDF. The IDF is Israeli Defense Forces. And But if you're in Saudi Arabia, for example, and you're a woman, you don't get to choose your career. Your guardian, who is either your your father, your uncle, your brother, even if you you have a son, he, your son gets to decide these things. You are, in a sense, a ward or a child. It's infantilizing, right? So they get to decide if you get to leave the house. They get to decide if you're allowed to marry, whom you're allowed to marry, what kind of job you're allowed to have, whether you're allowed to leave the country, whether you can sign a contract, get a passport. Your life is really subordinated to some man in your family, however distant a relation it is. And the kind of things you can aspire to do, can you be the prime minister of Saudi Arabia? No, it's an absolute monarchy. Can you, can you start a company? I don't think it's going to be very easy for you, uh, given that you have to get through all these hoops. And then how are you going to sell things to men, right? You have to, you're not allowed to be in the company of a man you're unrelated to. There's so many obstacles in the way of people living. And this, what unites the problem in Saudi Arabia is the absence of freedom. It's not a free society. It's a very controlled, religiously totalitarian monarchy that tells people what you think, what you want, doesn't matter. To hell with that. And that is a, that is a, a, a huge moral issue. It means that the lives of people in Saudi Arabia are that much poorer spiritually and materially than they would be in a freer, freer society. And so that's just one contrast, but it's true relative to all the other countries in the Middle East that Israel is by far the freest country in that part of the world. And that, has, that, that should be part of our moral thinking about its character. What, what does that mean? And the argument I present in the book is that we should use that standard of freedom to evaluate Israel's character and its, its policies and its deeds, but also the same standard to apply to the Palestinian movement, which is an ideological, political en en enterprise that seeks or claims to seek to liberate the Palestinian people or, or right wrongs done to them. And I, I distinguish the Palestinian people from the Palestinian movement. Uh, mm. There's overlap. A lot of Palestinians support the movement, and a remarkable, overwhelming number do, but not everyone does. And the ideological political movement that is the Palestinian movement is essentially a dictatorship seeking territory. I mean, it is cut from the same cloth as the Saudi Arabia regime, as the Iranian regime, as the Jordanian regime. It's a it's a combination of factions, some of whom are theocratic, like Iran or Saudi Arabia, some of whom are dictatorial, like what Saddam Hussein's regime was or what Syria is today. And what they've been doing over the last uh, 70 plus years as a movement is seeking to undermine Israel as a free society and, and liberate it by, when I put that in scare quotes, but what they mean is to eliminate that society and in, replace it with something that dominates people, that subjugates people, that takes freedom and destroys it and makes people's lives, it turn, it basically enslaves people politically in the way that 
you know, if you lived under Assad in Syria before the civil war, or if you lived, if you lived today in Jordan or Egypt, the kind of control you have over your life is negligible, and the opportunities you have to thrive are minimal. Economically, those societies are basket cases. There's no, I mean, they really don't register technologically and scientifically in terms of achievements. And that's because of how bad those governments are. They're very controlled. And the contrast is with Israel, which is, for all its faults, it's a society that leaves people largely free. And it has become a technological, economic, and scientific dynamo. I mean, the number of scientific articles that come out of Israel per capita is, is on par with the U.S. and the United Kingdom, which are, yeah. you know, re-advanced societies. And we were talking uh, before we were shooting about the size of Israel. You were saying it's comparable to New Jersey, yeah. only about a mile wide, yeah, well, which is insane. It's a, Sorry, not a mile wide. It's like an hour drive Oh, I'm wide. sorry. That's yeah. what you said. A mile yeah. <laughs> would, be, yeah. would be. I mean, in some places, it's very, very narrow, um, yeah. but it depends how fast you drive. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the important thing is that that is to view the two sides from the same standard and say, well, look, if you really care about human life and progress and the ability of an individual to make the best of their life and thrive, what kind of society, what kind of ideas lead to that? And, and the answer I give is it's a free society to the extent you can develop it. What the Palestinian movement seeks to do is not create a free society. And we know that based on not just what they've put in their manifestos and their speeches in there, but we've seen it in action to the extent they've had control over territory, um, the beginnings of a state since two, 1994. And the tragedy is some of the worst victims of the Palestinian movement, the obvious ones are the Israelis who've been harmed in various attacks and, and, and wars and so forth, that, that people recognize. But the, the unrecognized victims are the people who are in the Palestinian community who have become subject to the Palestinian movement's control, mm. it's kind of government, and who want a better life, who don't believe in the goals of the Palestinian movement. They don't want war and they don't want tyranny. They want freedom. And there, I believe there are people like that, and they are victims of their own leaders. Mm. And that, that's a tragedy that needs to be recognized. Yeah. Do you mind if we, if we talk about the history yeah. of how we even got to where we, we how they got to where they are yeah. today. Sure. It's such a fascinating history. Obviously, it's super complex. But yeah, if yeah, take it take it away because it's so interesting. So the there's a as you put it, there's a long history. The, the book I I try to just delimit it to the last seventy or so years, yeah. and that is seventy years or so is nineteen forty eight is when Israel declared its independence. I talk a little bit about the period before that, but the, the basic gist of the the history is around the um, the turn of the century, the turn of the twentieth century, uh, in Europe, the climate for Jews became really oppressive, and you, you probably know about some of the pogroms or the persecution of Jews in in Russia. In other countries in Europe, it was really bad. And of course, the middle of the twentieth century, we see the rise of Nazism. Uh, and, and their the, their takeover of Europe. So the, the whole climate became really untenable. And there were people saying, well, we need a solution to this. And one of the solutions was, let's create a country where we don't have to live with this kind of oppression. And that was the Zionist movement. So the, the people have heard about mm -hmm. this issue. And the Zionist movement is a kind of, um, it's a miscellaneous, all kinds of views movement. It's a big tent. And some of them were more rational than others. Some of them were crazy, cuckoo crazy. <laughs> um, and it's important to, to recognize that there's, there's that variation among them. But I think the better among them were interested in a society that is basically free. And, and um, that is the vision they, sent, they, they set up. Uh, what happens in the early decades of the 20th century is uh, there's a lot of kind of political changes in that part of the world. Uh, uh, the major player that ruled it was the Ottoman Empire and it crumbles after World War One. The British and French roll in. Basically, the British take over what is now Israel. It was called it was just called Palestine, and they were given a mandate under the League of Nations, which came before the UN. And basically, it was the goal is to create a society for the Jewish people, and the British would leave, and the, the Jews would have a country, and at the same time, it would be a um, a country that treated all its subjects equally. So it wouldn't be Jews are above the Arabs. It would be everyone would have equal rights, basically. There's a lot of friction over that for, for a number of decades. And the population there, the Arab, and a, Arab is a difficult term to pin down, but it's basically mostly Muslims, some Christians, and various other subgroups. 
some of them were really unhappy, and their leaders in particular were unhappy because what they wanted was their own kind of fiefdom, their own um, kind of society that they would rule. It came to a head in 1948 with a war in which um, there, was a, there was a deal where um, Israel and the Arabs, there would be two countries. This is called the partition plan, basically. And it came to a head where the Arab states nearby and the, and the Arab leadership inside rejected that deal. Israel accepted the deal, and there was a war of independence, basically. So um, the war led to Israel becoming its own society, and the Arabs who rejected the state didn't get the state they wanted because they turned down that offer. So what you have is a society now in, in that part of the world that is, I think, they had a lot of strange views. Uh, they were less free at the beginning than they were decades later. Some of them were socialists. They, they re-screwed up the economy over the period of time. The Arabs? No, the, the Jews, mm -hmm. the, the leadership of the, the, Isra the, the new state of Israel. But the upshot is that the countries that invaded Israel in the war of 1948 were, were claiming that they're fighting for a Palestinian state. And the fact is that that's really not what they were after. They were after taking over the land that was very appealing militarily and economically because it led on to the Mediterranean Sea and there's all kinds of commercial applications for it. So there's this mythology that the war of the five Arab nations invaded to abort Israel at its independence. The, the story is it was for the sake of the Palestinian people. And in fact, the invading armies didn't care about the people in Palestine, the Arab populations. They treated them badly during the war. And their whole goal, and they, they didn't coordinate because they were each trying to grab a piece of land. It was, a, it was basically a, a scrimmage for conquest mm -hmm. by regimes that were themselves authoritarian monarchies and so on. Okay, so that gives you kind of the Yeah, the yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good uh, uh, foundation. Yeah. Now, the, that war of 1948 was a failure in the sense that the, the five invading Arab countries didn't achieve what they wanted, which was to stop the creation of Israel and keep it as an Arab kind of society and, and grab various parts of it. And ever since then, it was the people living there feel like we were betrayed. We were told there would be an easy victory, and it wasn't. So then what, are, what happens is there's a number of other conflicts following that, where the goal again is to say, okay, we can't have this society Israel in our midst. They're not Muslims, so we hate them. And they're not like us, they're Europeans, and we hate them. Even though it's not true, most of them were not, not all of them were Europeans. So there were outsiders in two senses, and there was, we can't have outsiders in our midst. And there's kind of a progression of um, who comes to the fore, who, who's leading the charge against Israel. The next major episode is 1967 where the leader of that, so the most charismatic leader among the Arab regimes was Gamal Abdel Nasser, who had a vision that the Middle East would become an, an Arab nation. Like all the countries would basically be one, and you know, he, he'd be happy to be the ruler. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can, he's, yeah. he's basically a would-be tyrant, and he was a tyrant within Egypt. And so he, he was gonna launch this war and finally liquidate Israel because they failed in the previous attempts. That failed as well. So the, the, the way that, that war is known today is the Six-Day War, because Israel defeated its aggressors, the countries aggressing against it, in a matter of six days. And this was a, a shock to most people, because they thought maybe they couldn't make it. Okay, so, the, so what happens is the Arab nations that were fighting since 1948 and 1967, they kind of push to the, to the background. And what comes to the fore is a new movement um, kind of a newly uh, empowered movement called the calling itself the Palestinian movement. And the, the main group that united the various factions was the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. And people might know, if, if you look at the PLO, you'll see the face associated with it is a man called um, Yasser Arafat. He was their sort of poster boy or their leader. Now, what happens is that the PLO is essentially funded, endorsed, and created by these Arab nations. And it is both their mercenary force for their fighting among themselves, and it is also their proxy force, sort of their, their subcontractor, if you will, in a trying to a new tactic to liquidate Israel. So they felt like we tried the conventional wars in 48, there was another war in 56, there was all kinds of skirmishes through the 60s. And then 67, we tried a conventional war, we failed. So let's try a new kind of military tactic. And this was sort of the guerrilla warfare tactic, which they saw 
in Vietnam beginning to come out in the fore and say, well, let's try that. Here we have um, a bunch of scrappy so-called freedom fighters, the Palestinian uh, guerrillas, and we'll put them on center stage and we'll have them be the ones fighting Israel. Now, what happens is that this gives the whole conflict a very different moral perspective for many people. So in the past, it was Israel as this tiny little country, a kind of David, and all these Arab countries around it repeatedly trying to invade it and attack it, a kind of Goliath. What happens with the Palestinian movement's emergence onto the scene as a sort of the leading force is it comes to be seen as the small David and Israel is this towering Goliath suddenly. So the moral dimensions of the conflict are flipped. And ever since then, the Palestinian movement has been claiming that all it's after is righting wrongs against the Palestinian people. And in fact, what it's been doing is trying different strategies and tactics to liquidate Israel. Some of it is through fighting over the border with, with Jordan or from Lebanon. And some of it is through terror tactics. And the, so that brings you through to about 1990, 95 or so. And there's a, in 94, there's a, there's a peace agreement that's signed uh, and cr leads to the creation of a Palestinian state or mini uh, to interim state, something that will eventually become an independent sovereign state. This is called the Palestinian Authority. So the deal is Israel gives some land to the Palestinian movement and they create the state and they rule the people in it and Israel is there. So in effect, it's you said you wanted a state. Here you go. Let's see if this works out. And the vision for that was two states living side by side in peace and, and coexistence. The story didn't turn out that way. That led to um, even worse fighting, even worse um, terrorism during the 90s, worse than the previous two decades in terms of human toll. Uh, I'm sorry, who was that peace agreement between? So this was between Israel mm -hmm. and the PLO. Okay, the so it was between those two. It wasn't being yeah. brokered by a, a third party like... Well, the U.S. was kind of a go-between, and, and it, it, mm -hmm. the, the details of the plan kind of... Well, let's put it this way. Uh, Bill Clinton wanted the prestige of brokering this. So he jumped on the bandwagon. He brought them to the White House to do the signing ceremony. And he wanted to be associated with this because he thought this would lead to this. Would go, this was going to work and he would get his Nobel Prize from it and whatever else he thought he might or just the prestige of, of being the broker. But America's role in it kind of was on and off. So sometimes America was pushing the two sides together. Sometimes it was, well, you guys figure it out. And it kind of oscillated. I see. But they were both parties were Israel and Palestine were in agreement on this. So when you say it starts to fall through. Yeah. So let me just clarify something. So they, they signed broad terms of what an agreement would entail. And they call this the, the Declaration of Principles, which in the in diplomacy, there's it's very arcane. Basically, you agree to the terms of how you would sit at the table, basically. Very kind of preliminary things. Then when you get to the table, you talk about, well, what would it look like for us to talk about something? And once we talk about something, what would it look like for us to sign something? Once we sign something, how do we implement it? And then it's a very long process. But what they signed was very broad strokes. And I say it didn't work out because the what was missing, one of the things that was missing in people's understanding of the Palestinian movement at the time was... They took them at face value. Like all they want is to right wrongs. All they want is a new state of their own. And, and it was in re disregard of what the nature of that state would be, whether it would be free or not. And what happened is that the Palestinian movement never really gave up on the goal of its sort of militant goal of destroying Israel as a free society and creating a, a dictatorial society of its own. And so when they were given, to the extent they were given political control and the Palestinian authority, they went about creating a dictatorship over their own people and, and then using that territory as a staging ground for attacks and further assaults upon Israel. So it, it fell apart very quickly. And there were many attempts to patch the agreements and add more because it, it rolled out in phases. Mm -hmm. And th just the what that led to is by the 2000s, so about seven years into this agreement, there is one last ditch effort. And this is Bill Clinton summons Arafat uh, and the Israeli prime minister at the time to Camp David, where he has his vacation home. He said, OK, we're going to do this. This is the f we're going to break down all the barriers between you guys. We're going to come to an agreement, which is by that point, it's kind of crazy because what they've done is they've created a new kind of terrorist state, the Palestinian Authority. 
and it was really terrible for its own people. Like the, they had no freedom. Uh, they were subject to Arafat as a dictator, and that was not going away. So it was already a foolish enterprise, but it didn't. So they offered more land, more territory as as part of this land for peace deal. What happened is that that fell apart. That attempt to reach a final solution in 2000, and that led to an even worse uprising. A Palestinian, in fact, they call it a second uprising or intifada, but better description for it was a terror war. And this is the uh, the turning point in the conflict in this sense. Um, within the, this is a little bit inside baseball, but I promise it gets to it gets to an important no, I'm, point. I'm interested. No. <laughs> what, what's important at this point in the sort of 90s and 2000s is. There was always friction within the Palestinian movement over what ideas they stood for. So for a long time, it was a kind of Marxist, Leninist, nationalist or racist kind of view where we would have a Palestinian national homeland. And they were, they were literally Marxist, Leninist uh, thinkers. But at the same time, there was in, in the 80s, they sprang up as part of a regional development, Hamas, or the Islamic resistance movement, which is a jihadist group within Palestine. It's an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, and it's backed or has been backed at various times by Iran. Now, this group comes and challenges the, the leadership of the Palestinian Authority and says, you guys are sellouts. So just imagine the Palestinian leadership, which is waging this terror war and created its own dictatorship, and the Islamists come along and says, you guys are sellouts. You're not strong. You're not committed enough to the goal of liquidating Israel. It sounds crazy even to say it in those terms, right? But that's really what the conflict was over. And what happens in the next two decades is the Islamists, particularly Hamas, though they weren't the only ones, they rise to prominence. They become, they gain moral stature, and they're seen as these are the uncorruptible leaders of the Palestinian movement. And they, in effect, by the mid 2000s, they they are the vanguard. They're the leaders. So the the, the conflict becomes a bunch of dictators trying to create their own new state under a Palestinian flag to a bunch of Palestinian jihadists trying to create a jihadist state. And that's who we have today in Hamas. And the, there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot more to, to mm -hmm. fill in the details, but the, you get from, there's a, a desire to create a new society that's basically free and that would make everyone free. And, and reject, that, that's rejected by the, the Christian and Muslim population and the neighboring Arab states. Repeated attempts to liquidate Israel over time by those Arab states. A, an attempt to create a new movement of sort of these uh, underdogs, the Palestinian movement, the PLO, and repeat and an attempt to make them sort of the sympathetic party in this conflict, uh, to the point where they're they're eclipsed by sort of the worst possible group, which is the jihadists of Hamas. Mm -hmm. So, the conflict went from being about uh, what kind of society should there be for the Jews and the Arabs who live there to well, now today, it's there's a basically free, modern, scientific society, Israel, and a group, the jihadists of Hamas and others and their allies, seeking to destroy that and create their own kind of uh, Islamist tuning, which they have in the Gaza Strip, which is a territory that they gained control of. Mm -hmm. So it, I argue in the book, and I and I hope that sort of the summary illustrates this a little, it, it's, it's what's at stake here is not about land primarily. It's about what you do with the land. It's the philosophic issue of is it free or not. And it's it's really a conflict between freedom and tyranny. Mm -hmm. And it's variations on the theme of tyranny. So it's, sometimes it's secular dictators, sometimes it's theocrats. But that's that's momentous. That's basically, it doesn't matter where you are politically. It doesn't matter what you think of Israel's religion or the Arab religion or the Muslim religion. It doesn't matter where you stand on those issues. If you care about human lives, and freedom and progress, you should stand with those who represent it and try to achieve it, not those who are trying to destroy it and, and stamp out individuals and their freedom under the flag mm -hmm. of uh, Islamic totalitarianism. Can we talk about the Palestin Palestinian grievances mm -hmm. that you write about? Because right now there's a really strong anti-Israel sentiment, I feel like. And if, you know, Israel is the outlier of the Middle East, if it's uh, you know, the, the only place in the Middle East where you can be truly free and live your best life, why wouldn't more people be for Israel? Why, why is Palestine the, um, the David here, mm -hmm. if Israel's the good guy? Right. So there's a number of grievances. I talk about four major ones in the book. I think that to, but 
before we get to that, I think part of the answer to your question is why aren't more people on Israel's side, I think there's two parts of that. Some of it is the grievances and people's feeling that, well, maybe the Palestinians have something on their side. And I think there, that takes some thought in figuring out. I mm -hmm. think there are issues to be dealt with. I don't dismiss them at all. But I think a bigger part of the story is there is a kind of hostility to Israel because it's free and because it's successful. It's seen as a rebuke to the societies around it, which is in a, in a kind of multicultural society that we have today. It's who are we to judge? Like all societies are equal. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I beg to differ. And here's an example. Here, this, they, they start with even less than Saudi Arabia, right? Saudi Arabia has all these oil wells. And Israel doesn't have any of these things. It, a lot of it was desert. And they managed to create a much more thriving society than Saudi Arabia. And well, that means that not all societies are equal. If you have a standard of human life, they're not. So I think it, sort of in, in North America and Europe, a big part of the issue is there is um, dislike for the fact that Israel is successful. And then there's other layers to it. Some of it comes, there are people who are anti-Semitic and anti-Israel for sort of religious and secular reasons, mm -hmm. sorry, religious and racist reasons. And that feeds into it, but I don't think that's the whole story. So there's that part of it, the, the fact that it's successful and is a rebuke. Um, then if we turn to the, the grievances, part of the issue with the grievances is how people evaluate them. So if we look at the kind of narratives that come out from the, say, boycott, divestment, sanctions mm -hmm. movement. BDS. The BDS, as they're called. Um, there are things there that will tug at the heartstrings. Families that were ripped from their homes 70 years ago. Refugees were not allowed to return home. And Israel is a strong, militarily powerful force, and it's punching down. Mm -hmm. Now, if you hear that, that's going to activate in people a certain kind of emotional response. And it, it, it's designed to be that way. It's, well, these people are getting screwed. And it's this big, powerful Israel is the bad guy. And there's a way in which people are preyed upon by this kind of narrative, which is designed to trigger them in a certain emotional way. And what happens is that their conventional views of morality lead them to think, well, there's got to be something on this side. The Palestinian cause has to have some, some legitimacy, even if we don't agree with everything they do. And it, there's got to be something wrong with Israel. Maybe their, their success is built on the back of the Palestinians. Maybe they're exploitative. Right. But that's not a rational way to think about things. That is not what justice would tell you to do. Justice would tell you to look at the facts and look at the actual grievances and evaluate them by the standard of freedom. Like, who has someone's freedom been violated, their individual rights been violated? So some of the grievances have to do with the War of 1948, which mm -hmm. I mentioned. Some of them have to do with current policy about how Israel treats land and confiscates land. So the big one, the one that the BDS movement talks about, is refugees and the, the taking of land mm -hmm. at the origin. That's, I would say that's what yeah. I had heard of yeah. the most. Mm -hmm. Now, those are hard issues in the historical details. But the, the short answer or the short summary I would give here, and there's more detail obviously in the book, is there, the, the basic origin of how Israel came to be is that there were individuals and organizations that came and actually purchased land from their owners. And in many cases, I think the owners were, as far as I know, they were the rightful owners. There were people living on that land as tenants or, or sharecroppers, in effect. And some of them were really unhappy about being told to go and work somewhere else because that's where they lived. Um, and, but though the, many of them were offered compensation as a result. Now, when you get into the details of this, the question is, has that person's right being violated. Well, I don't think if, if so if you rent an apartment and you're, the apartment building is sold to a new owner and they raise the rent or they say, well, you know, we're renovating, everyone has to leave when their lease expires. Has your right been violated? I think the answer to that is no, mm -hmm. unless the contract says you need more, more notice or unless the contract says you can't raise the rent or something like that. So you have cases like that back at the origin of Israel and the, how it acquired the land. And they're so it's not a case of the land being stolen in the strict legal sense of what you would describe as they had rights to this property and then it was taken from them. There were people who were unhappy about having to move or having land that they used to apply, take and, and use for other purposes. Uh, but that's different. And it, it's 
the the accusation there is a slippery one because it, it's designed to muddy those differences between actual theft of like property that was yours and taken wrongfully and well there are circumstances which are out of your control sometimes but they're not good for you and you don't like them but that's part of life and you, there's ways to get around it and all of this has to be put in the context that the incoming uh, Jews and Zionists and whatever they describe themselves some of them were rapidly hostile to Judaism which is weird um, they came along <laughs> they, really? yeah I mean one of the founders of Israel David Ben-Gurion was a, 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 an atheist as far as I can tell he didn't want to he respected the Bible wouldn't sign wouldn't um, swear an oath to it he didn't observe the Jewish customs he was a very ardent socialist so you could imagine the, oh the interesting yeah uh, but the, so the, the what happens is that this is in the context of incredible economic development of the area was new factories factories that Arabs and the, there are developing themselves not just that the Jews are creating and the, the establishment of new medical facilities and you talk about the standard of living right there's a huge up. spike in the standard of living and the, and the the Arab population grows substantially over the first few decades because this the quality of health care and food and sanitation improves so this is in a climate where the society is being improved materially um, uh, in the in the run-up to the creation of Israel. So there's the, there's some hard cases to deal with in this context, but I think the, the bottom line is Israel was founded on purchased land, essentially, not stolen land. That's one of the big issues. The The case with refugees is, again, it's more... Uh, there's a lot of details. I'm not giving the full answer, but the, the basic issue is in the War of 48 that I mentioned, where the Arab states, as part of that war, invaded with the goal of okay, we're getting rid of this Israel, we're going to grab the land and create a, our own fiefdoms. As part of that, a lot of people left their homes to, to avoid fighting. And this happens in every war. You could see it now in Syria. This is one of the worst humanitarian refugee crises in, in, the last, in, in recent memory, almost as bad as World War II. It's a natural and unavoidable part of war. The question is, who's to blame for the war? Because mm -hmm. then those are the people culpable for the fact of refugees. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in my argument is, basically, it's who instigates the war. It's the, the, the leaders within and the armies without who invaded, who caused this war to, to come about. Within this, there are claims and subclaims about Israeli forces. Of the, they weren't quite Israeli, but the, the, what became Israeli forces um, causing villagers to leave their home at gunpoint, basically, and saying, well, you have to leave. Now, there are cases of that documented. And the question is, was that part of a concerted plan to make them leave? Or was it military necessity in given circumstances? And I think the evidence is there was no overall plan to kick them out. In fact, I think there, there were many cases of the Israeli uh, population asking and encouraging the Arabs to stay in where they were. But there were cases of military uh, uh, groups and, and battalions clearing out villages because they didn't want potentially hostile groups at their flank. And it's one of those things that happens out of, you know, it's a tactical step you have to do. Um, and those people, some of them never got to go back to their homes. And that's sad. And it's very bad. Now, the history of the refugees is itself, it's, it deserves its own book. And I don't, I don't have the, the room in my book to deal with it at length. But the part of the tragedy is that the refugees were not welcomed in the countries they went to. They were kept as refugees rather than resettled. And there was a deliberate goal behind that, which was to keep them as a kind of uh, reminder to the world that Israel is responsible for these people not having their homes again, which is a real inversion of responsibility here, which is like, if you start a war and a bunch of people leave their homes and then they some of them come to your territory you're responsible for having started this problem and you should help solve it. What would happen if they did try to resettle in a neighboring country? Well, in, in, in one case, they were, they were, I think Jordan has allowed some of them to become citizens. It's one of the few countries that that's true. But even there, there are still Palestinians who are... Um, is, Lebanon's a good example where they weren't allowed to resettle, except they're, they're kept in these camps or sort of small villages that are ramshackled. And they're not even allowed to work certain jobs. They're really kept back... Um, and in effect punished by the, the, the regimes that have taken them in. And again, it's, it's purposely to keep this issue of the refugees alive with the goal of imputing the guilt, or kind of casting aspersions against Israel. 
Uh, in fact, the idea of resettlement was the d default view of many people, including the U.S. at the time. But there was resistance to it from the Arab countries from the origin of this, which is it's really heartbreaking because in most cases of refugees, that's what happens. Either you're allowed to go back for not always, rarely, actually, or you find another place to, to start and make the best of your life. And you're one of the people who wars grind up and it's, it's tragedy. That's part of the horror of war. But the claim now isn't, so to, to take it honestly, you would have to say, well, let's understand the culpability for the war. Let's understand how these refugees became refugees and who's responsible, who's to blame for that mm -hmm. and point the finger in the right direction and, and demand of those groups, the Arab regimes that were involved, demand of them that they, be, that they um, right this wrong. Instead of doing that, um, the Palestinian movement has made the refugee problem into this massive, like, so there were roughly 700,000, let's say, people at the time, 1948, who left their homes, maybe 770, let's say. And since then, partly through the way the UN accounts for them and partly through the way the Palestinian movement has inflated this issue, today there are something like 5 million refugees, and that's, which is, defies human mortality, right? Because there are not more refugees from World War II today than there were after World War II. And the reason for that is the, the way they account for refugees is both people who at the time were left their homes and couldn't go back and their descendants through the male line and their children and even adopted children. It's, it's really strange accounting. So oh, interesting. what happens now, so what would it mean for the refugee problem to be resolved along the lines that the Palestinian movement would like it to be resolved? They want a right of return, which means... All five million people who were defined as refugees would go back to where exactly? Some of them were never born there. Some mm -hmm. of them were. Mm -hmm. And this is a population that's been hard done by, by the people that hosted them, but also indoctrinated with really bad ideas and a, and a real hostility to Israel. Now, Israel has done wrongs, and I talk about them in the book, but nothing remotely close to what uh, these people have been told and have been encouraged to believe. And... I think the the refugee crisis or problem as it is today is a it's a way of stopping the conflict from being resolved because so long as the demand is that all these five million people, many of whom are really hostile, would come back, it's not clear where they would go, what kind of society that would look like, how open they are to being in a free society and respecting the rights of other people. If you ask them, many of them would like to pull down Israel and, and collapse it. So. It's it's a many-layered tragedy with a lot of dishonesty in the way people deal with it. So there are ways to resolve it. Like you could talk about the people who are still alive today who are refugees and through no fault of their own are, are refugees. And their homes are still there. They could actually go back to them. And they really want to live in a free society. They're not part of the Palestinian movement. You could come up with a rational context for how to resolve the Palestinian refugee problem. But that looks very different. It's very selective and it, it has objective standards for who you would accept and under what conditions and what their lives would look like. It's very different from a wholesale, uncritical uh, encouragement that five million plus people yeah. walk back to who knows exactly what. Now, what do they say they want? Do they say that their goal is to liquidate Israel? So, yeah, is that look, public? Look at the charter said. of the Hamas movement from 1988. That is their goal. The PLO documents, their um, their national uh, um, document. It's so these are documented statements. Yeah, and it's not only in their document statements. It's also in their actions and their speeches. And there's this funny play that they have where, in speeches and writings and television uh, broadcasts to their own audiences, they will talk about it. But when it's to a Western audience, they will speak in a very kind of measured and, and uh, euphemistic terms and a lot of code words. So um, when you think about the occupation, like occupation is a big word it's thrown around a lot. Um, there's a real challenge about how to define it. What exact, what land exactly do you think Israel is occupying? Yeah, yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. And so at different times, it's been different pieces of land. And we can talk about it. Is it does it include the West Bank and Gaza, or is it just the West Bank? And, and what about the Golan Heights? And but if you so there's real questions about how to think about that, and, and at what point you regard Israel as an occupying power? Is it even an occupying power? Is a debate about that. But then 
th th those are real questions, right? But then you turn to the way the Palestinian community and the Palestinian movement talk about occupation. They don't mean just the land that Israel has control over since 1967, which, which is uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. They don't just mean the land that Israel controlled in 1948. They mean all the land. Like there is no part of the land that they regard as unoccupied. So to them, occupation is a kind of code word or, or a dog whistle, in effect, for Israel's presence in any of the land that we regard as we should control. It is our patrimony. It's our, you know, so our forefathers. So all of what is today Israel, they consider mm -hmm. that part of the occupation as well. Yeah. When they say occupation. Yeah. And it's, a, it's also an all-purpose accusation that the occupation is everything Israel does wrong in addition to the land that it controls. So there's very strange ways of seeing it. And now it's, it's worth looking at the way they talk about it, which is what I mentioned now, and the way they talk about it in TV and, and in broadcasts, in radio and in speeches, but also look at the textbooks that they give their children and what they teach them about what is Palestine. It isn't this piece of land that we would get if we uh, sign this peace agreement, mm -hmm. like with two countries mm -hmm. side by side. Like a two-state right. uh, solution? Right, the two-state mm -hmm. solution. You could draw it all kinds of different ways on the map. That's not the map they give their children. The, the map they give their children has one state. Really? And it's Palestine, and it's all of Israel, in effect. So those kinds of things are, they're more evidence of a, of a perspective that is, this isn't just about you want a better life. This is there's a the Palestinian movement is not about giving their people a better life. In fact, they haven't taken reasonable steps to right any wrongs. In fact, they've committed many wrongs against their own people by you know denying them freedom, denying them freedom of speech, denying them the ability to live and exploiting them. I mean the the kind of corruption we hear about in um, various Arab countries where, you know, the dictator has a various police forces and if they stop you in the street, they can take your car. It's kind of arbitrary arrest. You talk about the morality police. Yeah, there's morality yeah. police. That happens in the Palestinian territories. It is just like it's, it's of a piece with the kind of societies beyond Israel's borders. So the, the, the Palestinian movement, in my view, is not true to its word at all. It, it presents a, a facade of seeking to right wrongs, and that's a lie. It's, it's not really the motive. Because um, I think there, there are real things that need to be done to, to right wrongs. There are actual wrongs that need, right now that should be righted, and I mentioned many of them in the book, but that's not at all the kind of thing that is being pursued or, or really championed. In fact, if you were concerned with freedom and the lives of individuals, you wouldn't educate your children, you would indoctrinate them with the ideals of martyrdom and these horrific attacks where people strap on suicide belts and go into a pizzeria and blow themselves up, that is not a path to a greater, freer society. Um, and so the, the one piece here that's really helpful, I find, in, in, in thinking about this is when Palestinians say they want a state, the question is what kind of state? Do you, do you really want a free society? And the only justification for a new state is that you would be freer in it. And hmm. that's the evidence is you wouldn't be. And many Palestinians themselves don't want to live under their rulers. They want to live under Israeli rule. And that's been true for a long time. Because they recognize, look, we, we might hate the Israelis. We might, we might think they're, they're scum because they're Jews. We might not like being, um, you know, there's jokes about us. Maybe, they're, maybe people don't treat them fairly in the society. But they would much rather live in Israel because of all the opportunities that it presents and the freedom that they actually have, as opposed to the mythological freedom that their leaders talk about. Um, and that's a reality. I mean, th there are people in Israel who have citizenship who are Arabs. They, they don't want to give it up and move under the Palestinian Authority or under Hamas because they know that whatever, whatever distaste they might have for Israel it is way better than living under a tyranny next door. Can you speak at all to your research of the, the current situation, I, I, um, more of a day-to-day -day basis? Because I feel like I've heard kind of extremes on both sides in terms of, you know, the protests that have, I mean, been going on for forever, but as I know recently there were some, some big ones. Um, I've heard from one side that um, the Israeli forces have just been brutal against the Palestinians. Um, you know, just th like I've literally heard th that thousands have been killed by Israelis, you know, headshots that they're wearing shirts with uh, 
pregnant women with crosshairs on them. And then I've also heard um, and read that essentially the other side that Israeli forces are just defending their borders from um, violent, uh, you know, protesters and rioters, um, and that they're simply just defending. Um, can you can you speak to that at all? Because it seems like just two completely different narratives. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I haven't been on the ground in, in this particular mm -hmm. situation, so I, I don't have firsthand knowledge of what the Israeli forces are doing, but based on their practice and the kind of policies they have, the I think they are defending their border. I mean, if, if the with the conflict at the border of Gaza, the fence that they had, there's a real issue there, which is repeatedly in the past there have been rockets fired out mm -hmm. of Gaza. There have been tunnels dug with the aim of infiltrating Israel, kidnapping people, and killing them. So if people are marching toward the fence with the goal of penetrating the fence, that is a border that you would want to defend. Are they using excessive force? I haven't. I don't know that they are or not. I suspect that there's a lot of misinformation about what they do, based on the fact that when they were actually in a war with with the Hamas faction in Gaza in 2014, and since then there've been other skirmishes, but there was a ground war and an air war with Hamas. The Israeli forces, we know because of documentation, because of video, they bend over backwards to comply with international laws of war, which have to do with protecting, in part, to protect uh, civilians in the area, to the point where they, they even forfeit the advantage that they have by giving warning. Okay, you know, they, they drop leaflets saying, we're going we're gonna to be bombing here. We're going to be going after Hamas installations. We're going to go after your, you know, the people who are keeping you down. Leave, find some safe place to, to be. And texting people and phoning them, saying, "Look, where your building is targeted, you have ten, hour, you know, an hour to leave." And that, you know, if you're they a do that, they really do they that. They do that, yeah. And they wow. they did it to the point where they even have this technique where they shoot a warning missile at a building, which they call a knock on the roof. And once you hear that, you know it's within minutes you have to leave. So it, they go to all these lengths to uh, avoid civilian casualties to the point where even they sacrifice their own. Uh, security. So there's cases of ambushes that Hamas knows this and they take advantage of it. So that's the reputation they have. And I think that's the, the kind of military that they are. Now, are there soldiers who are doing bad things? That happens in all kinds of wars. And I, I don't know enough to say one way or the other. I'm skeptical of the stories because there is just an incredible amount of bad reporting about this, mm. which is it's bad in the sense that it's slanted by a desire to vindicate the Palestinian movement to the point where, I mean, there are stories, I, I talked to someone who was a journalist uh, for the AP in uh, Israel, and he worked in the, in the territories with the Palestinians. He tells a story about Hamas gunmen bursting into their newsroom and giving them an order saying, this is what you will not report about our, our activities. Wow. And not only do they have to comply with that, but they also don't report the fact that they were told to do this. Wow. So there's there's ways in which reporters are intimidated by the Palestinian movement. But then there's also the kind of sympathy that some reporters feel for the Palestinian. So I think there is bad reporting in, in multiple ways. Um, but I'm I mean it's it's quite possible, and I I mean I'm, I would believe stories if you could document the soldiers are doing the wrong things. And if that's the case, then under a rule of law, you would punish them if they're defying orders or behaving in ways that are reckless. But, but that's what a, a decent society would do. And I think Israel has taken some of its soldiers and punished them for wrongful conduct in the battlefield. So that's sort of the, the, the state of how they conduct themselves. There's, there's a second secondary question to ask, are the rules of war that they follow legitimate? Should they be giving so much warning? Should they be sacrificing the advantage that they have? Should they be handing a kind of tactical advantage to their enemy? And I've written about this in other contexts, and I think it's a real question that in any war, whether it's Israel versus the Palestinians or America versus whoever, there's real questions about the morality of war and how you would conduct it. Um, and I think a lot of the principles that are now uh, common in the conduct of war across Western countries are they're self-defeating in many ways. Um, so I, I'm not, a, I think there needs to be real thought about those principles in the first place, but th that's sort of a meta question mm -hmm. to your uh, yeah. issue. You also talk about why you think America's involvement 
um, has kind of been counterintuitive. Yes. Uh, many people think that America has been overly supportive of Israel, mm -hmm. and that's a problem. And I think that the evidence shows us an entirely different story, which is it's true America in terms of rhetoric and policy is, you know, you can't find an American diplomat or, or president who doesn't say, you know, we're the staunchest friends Israel has and we're the, you know, and then signing these massive military aid deals. So there's, at a certain level, it's plausible that America is super supportive of Israel. But I think there's something to that. It's, it's a reality to it. But what you see in terms of the practice of how America conducts its policy, it's very different. And it's the failing I, I would diagnose is that America is unprincipled. So it, it's, it has a lot of rhetoric pro-Israel. But when it comes to what do we do in practice, it doesn't evaluate the two sides objectively, Israel and the Palestinians. And as a result, it, it so the, the consequences of our policies have been we undermine the party that we say we're in favor of, and we empower the party that is hostile to our values. So the arch example of this is many people sing the praises of George W. Bush for being one of the most pro-Israel presidents in recent memory. And he, was, he thought of himself as super supportive, and a lot of the people who voted for him did so because they thought he was going to uh, be Israel's uh, defender. The reality is that it was George, under George W. Bush that the U.S. enabled the Islamists of Hamas to gain greater power than they had before through this democracy campaign that America brought to the Middle East. And what happens is um, the, the Bush administration said, we believe in democracy, everyone should have democracy, and we, don't, we can't tell you who should be the winner, right? That's part of what it means to have free elections. And that includes uh, Hamas. And this is completely out of context, because you'd have to say, well, is Hamas like um, the Green Party, like the Democratic Party? Is it a legitimate political endeavor, or is it a gang of killers trying to dominate and create a theocracy? It is that. It is not a political party that belongs in elections. It, it, people were telling the Bush administration, look at who these people are, judge them, evaluate them properly. And if you did that, you would say, they don't belong in elections, it's crazy. And yet we insisted, the U.S. insisted against the, the best advice within the administration and from Israel, this is madness. And in fact, what happened? The Hamas won the election. And once it did so by a landslide, uh, it won, and then it took over the Gaza Strip by force from its rival faction. Uh, so in effect, what happened is, in the name of this uh, confused vision of a democratic Middle East, and a, a vision that refuses to admit the facts, refuses to admit that Hamas is in fact as bad as it is, and that many people support it, in defiance of those facts, we pushed forward and we enabled them, we gave them greater power than they had. We, in effect, ushered them into uh, leadership of a, a new territory, the Gaza Strip. Um, so you, what you have is the, the president who is telling us he's going to rid the world of evil and go after terrorists wherever they are, creating a new Islamist terrorist regime, in effect, in Gaza. Now, that is a consequence of a policy that, has, that turns its back on moral judgment and turns its back on the ideal of freedom, even as they're talking about bringing democracy to the Middle East, because they really don't understand what democracy is. And they certainly did not understand what foundations of a free society are. So then this is under an American president who is pro-Israel. Now, th there's many ways in which people are not willing to admit that that was under Bush's tenure. Like, he's supposed to be a hero of this idea. But the reality is very different. I mean, our policy doesn't recognize the character of the two sides objectively, doesn't evaluate them. And the consequence is this chaotic uh, spinning of, of, well, you have elections. No, that didn't work. Well, maybe we should have a different leader. Uh, maybe that didn't work. Well, let's go back to the peace talks from 20 years ago. That's not going to work. Nobody believes in that. And it's just spinning around um, our, the same ideas, refusing to actually judge and face the facts. Do you think America should take a step back? I think they need to do two things. One is recognize that a lot of the problems are the result of an 
unprincipled approach and just admit that, okay, these are, this is on us. We, we've made this worse by trying to push these two parties to a peace agreement that was completely crazy, mm. that only could only have empowered the worst uh, of the Palestinian movement. Just admit that and start from zero and say, okay, that didn't work. We can't continue that. And the second thing is actually understand what it means to have a principled approach. So admit the failure and, and then uh, pursue the positive. And the positive would tell you, here's the scope of our interests in the Middle East. This is how to think of what's in our self-interest. If you're thinking back to our discussion of what is it to be selfish, have a selfish goal, which is what do we actually care about? We care about our lives, our freedom, and the threats to that. We care about freedom as an ideal for all people in all places. And we should be on this in our, in our foreign policy. We should be on the side of those who want freedom, try to realize it and, and pursue it wherever they are, whether they're among the Palestinians, whether they're in Israel, whether they're sitting in jails in Saudi Arabia or in Iran in the streets. Those are the people we should encourage and support and, and um, boost in, against the forces in the region that are obviously hostile to us, among them the various Islamist factions, the regimes that lead that movement, Iran, Saudi Arabia, um, and really put our foot down and say, we stand with freedom and free people. And that, in this case, it, to the extent Israel is free and for as long as it's free, we stand in support of them against all of those groups and regimes that are hostile to freedom. And we want to see, we want, we want those to be weaker and Israel to be stronger. Uh, and there's many ways that that would play out in practice, but I don't think turning our back on it is a solution because um, turning our back on it doesn't make the Islamists hate us less. <laughs> and it doesn't make Iran any less hostile or Saudi Arabia any better a regime. Um, and it makes part of having a principled approach is recognizing part of the mistakes we've made here are um, putting our arm around Saudi Arabia as if they're an ally, mm -hmm. which is a sordid, sordid policy. It's disgusting. Uh, and treating Iran, now we're treating them more as, a, as an enemy, which is an improvement, but still not a principled perspective on what Iran is about. And all kinds of ridiculous relationships we have with these regimes where, you know, if, if Assad weathers the civil war and he's, he's in power in five years' time, I wouldn't be surprised if he's treated as just one more leader in the region, despite everything he's done. Because I think the ability of our foreign policy thinkers and establishment to evaluate and act on our rational judgment is so low. It's, it's basically, it's anathema to, to them. They regard it as, well, that's only an obstacle to getting things done. And my argument is, no, it's the means of finding solutions and, and finding a, a, a rational path out of the chaos. Uh, so my answer is recognize the problem and then find the path to, to a better solution, which requires, it's, it's a necessary condition that we take the ideal of freedom and the, the principle of justice seriously and use it in our thinking about not only Israel and, Palest and the Palestinians, which is a, a kind of a, um, a subset of the problem, but the whole Middle East, which is a, 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 uh, an embarrassing, chaotic mess which passes for policy. It's not really policy. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.